Good evening and welcome once again to Irish Television Chicago. My name is Tom Looney. And I'm Siobhan Vogler. This evening we have some very good music lined up for you. We have the Bards from Ireland, also Barleycorn and Patrick Street. We've got news, sports and features coming up, but this month, all of September, playing at the Abbey is Pat Woods and he's singing for us now. This next song is about a young lad who was uh, lying in prison and this swallow came in flew in to the prison cell and built a nest there and after some time the swallow and her young ones flew away so he is trying to imagine what it would be like if he could fly away and be free like the swallow it's called in the corner of my prison cell in the corner of my prison cell a swallow built her nest and to see the freedom of that young bird it would your heart oppress as it lightly moved around my cell as much as for to say cheer up me lad and don't be sad Oh, 
that was another great number from Pat Woods. And now we have a group here from County Mayo that you have probably heard in the last few weeks, and that's the D team. Here we go, Johnny Gold. I've just stepped in to see you all. I'll only stay a while. I want to see how you get now. I want to see you smile. I'm happy to be back again to greet you there as more. For there's no hair else on earth just like the homes of Dunny. For Peter, I roll and I'll take the low and I'll be in Scotland before you. For me and my true love will never be together on the body. Perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror. Cause I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a head of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. But I'm doing the best that I can. Cause the treasure of all company Oh Lord, it's so hard to be humble When you're perfect in every way I can't wait to look in the mirror Cause I get better looking each day To know me is to love me Here we go, Mayo! Home to Mayo, home to Mayo, somebody's way. Have we any Mayo people here tonight? In the far light, the skies will be bright. To our hearts in that cottage in the county, Mayo. With the God save you kindly and so fresh and high. A lovely girl marching, shit on the side. No matter I roll back to my home in the county Mayo, home to Mayo, home to Mayo. Somebody's waiting for me there, I know. In the far light, the skies will be bright. Dream my heart's in the cottage in the county Mayo. Well, I'd love to go back to old Ireland once more. To love the Crowpatrick sit on the shore. I leave them all, no matter I roll, back to my home in the county Mayo. Home to Mayo, home to Mayo, somebody's waiting for me there, I know. In the far right, the skies will be bright, to the hearts in the cottage in the county. Welcome back again and of course still to come tonight on our sports report we have that very special feature on the big All-Ireland football game of the year, the All-Ireland football final from Croke Park. That's coming up like I said in our sports feature but now it's time for music from the Barleycorn. It's 
Of our gallant ship, and the fine old man was he. Saying this fishy mermaid has warned me of our doom, we shall sink to the bottom of the sea. And the ocean waves do roar, and the star millions do blow, and we poor sailor lads are skipping round the mast, while the land lovers lay down below, below, below. Up spoke the cabin boy of our gallant ship, and the fine young lad was he. Said I have a sweetheart in Salem by the sea, tonight she'll be weeping for me. And the ocean waves do roar, and the star millions do blow. And we poor sailor lads just skipping round the mast, while the land lovers lie down below, below, below. Up spoke the cook of our gallant ship, and the crazy owl was he. Said I care much more for my pots and my pans than I do for the bottom of the sea. And the ocean waves do roar, and the star millions do blow. And we poor sailor lads are skipping round the mast, while the land lovers lay down below, below. Lay down below Three times around Spun our gallant ship And three times around Spun she Three times around Spun our gallant ship And she sank to the bottom of the sea And the ocean waves to roar And the star millions to blow And we poor sailor lads Are skipping round the mast Lay down below, below, below Lovers lay down below Thank you. You can't trust the mermaids. Well, it's news time now, and of course, the big news this week isn't exactly news, it's sports. This has been the busiest week in sports for the past four years, and that's because it's Olympic time again. That's right, and uh, it's been uh, four years. Uh, 1984, I was out at the Olympics in, in Los Angeles, and uh, it doesn't seem like four years, but here we are, and uh, we'll be following the results of the Irish athletes in Korea, so stay, stay in tune with us in the next few weeks and hopefully we'll be bringing you some winnings from the Irish team. Keep our fingers crossed on that one. Meanwhile, here is Mike Shavlin in the news. Good evening. The inquest into the killing of three IRA volunteers in Gibraltar last March has been questioning the British soldier known as Soldier F for this past week. The soldier, who was a member of the SAS task force who opened fire on the three, told the coroner's office that it was necessary to shoot immediately because of the possibility that they might detonate a bomb by remote control. Mr. Patrick, uh, Patrick McCory, a lawyer for the next of kin, asked why an arrest operation turned into the killing of three unarmed persons. Quoting from the report of Professor Stan Watson, the Crown pathologist, Mr. McCory asked why it was necessary to shoot Son Savage 16 times in a frenzied attack. The courtroom in Gibraltar was packed to capacity every day for the hearing. Along with journalists, lawyers, and representatives of the families, the hearing is being closely followed by a number of civil rights organizations including Amnesty International, the National Council for Civil Liberties, and the Association for Legal Justice. Mr. Donna McDonough and David uh, and Mr. David Andrews, TD, are observing the proceedings on the part of the Irish government. 
A spokesman for the Association for Legal Justice has said his organization is very concerned about procedure at the inquiry. There are no formal rules of evidence, and as such, the Crown lawyer has access to police and witness statements which are not available to Mr. McCrory. Relatives of the Gibraltar Three have said that the evidence is now so clear and devastating that they will consider taking the case to the European Court of Justice. The inquiry continues today. Soldiers A, B, C, and D, and SAS intelligence agents known as H and J are still to give evidence. Seventy-two witnesses in all will be heard by the inquiry, including eyewitnesses of the incidents and medical experts. The identity of all SAS and British intelligence witnesses is protected, and they give evidence from behind a thick curtain in the courtroom. Security is tight, everyone entering and leaving the courtroom is body searched, and witnesses arrive and leave under armed guard. Two IRA prisoners serving life sentences in British jails have been denied access to marry each other in jail. Permission to marry had already been granted to Martina Anderson, 26, and Paul Cavanaugh, 32, and the wedding was scheduled to take place in Leicester Jail on October 12th. However, the British Home Secretary, Mr. Douglas Hurd, announced last week that the Home Office has decided to withhold permission for security and operational reasons. Article 12 of the European Convention on Human Rights entitles prisoners to marry in jail. This article was incorporated in British law by the Marriage Act of 1983. A spokesperson for the British Home Office said the office would not give journalists any further details and they would not discuss the affair of individual prisoners. Prisoners' rights organizations had said they will campaign on behalf of the prisoners to repeal a decision which is obviously arbitrary in nature. A new report on immigration entitled Irish Immigration, a Program for Action was launched in Dublin last week. The report is the result of a joint study by the Action Group and the Tide Research and Immigration Group in Dublin. The group conducted hearings over the past year in both London and Dublin and accepted submissions from individual applicants and organizations on the subject. Mr. Michael D. Higgins, a Labour Party TD, was a speaker at the launch of the new report. Mr. Higgins said the ideological acceptance of immigration involves a betrayal of the Republic. This included the betrayal of people's expectations that they could work and raise their families in their country, he said. MP for the British Labour Party, Mr. Bernie Grant, also attended the launch. Mr. Grant said the British authorities had a duty to address the awful housing conditions, high levels of unemployment, and employment mostly in low-paying jobs experienced by the Irish community and other ethnic minorities in Britain. The, the report sets out a number of recommendations for the Irish government. The overriding theme questions the necessity for emigration. It proposes that the government set up a task force to examine the causes of emigration, the impact of emigration on Irish society, and the experiences of Irish immigrants, and to make recommendations with a view to relieving the necessity for Irish people to emigrate. Ireland's Olympic hopes were given a last-minute boost last week because of the intervention of an Irish businessman as an, as an intermediary in the BLE dispute with six of the country's leading athletes. BLE, the Irish Athletics Governing Body, had threatened Eamon Coughlin, John Tracy, Marcus O'Sullivan, and others with suspension if they did not settle debts outstanding under the Trust Fund Agreement. However, it is now understood that Mr. Neil McCann chairman of the F-11 Fife's Corporation, has agreed to underwrite any discrepancy in the, in the amount sought and that paid by the athletes after the games. BLE Secretary Chris Wall said Mr. McCann's gesture would enable a suspension of the settlement until after the games. Mr. McCann is a former school's athletic champion. More than 1,000 people attended the funeral of Mr. Dan Spring, politician, trade unionist, and outstanding sportsman who died on September 6th. Mr. Spring held a Labor Party seat for the North Kerry constituency for a total of 11 general elections in a Dahl career which covered 38 years. He was a leading organizer of the trade union movement in Munster and a prominent voice for the Labor Party.
Dan Spring was a hero to all carrymen, Labor Party supporters and otherwise. He played football for the Kingdom County, winning three All-Ireland medals between 1939 and 1941. Representatives of all Irish political parties, trade unions, business sections, and sporting organizations filled St. John's Church in Tralee for the funeral mass. Dr. O'Sullivan, Bishop of Kerry, presided over the celebrated mass. Monsignor John O'Keefe, Dean of Kerry, said Mr. Spring was a man who never lost the common touch and whose heart went out to everyone, though he walked with princes. The president was represented by his aide-de-camp, Commandant Michael McMahon. Mr. Spring's coffin was flanked by members of the Parliamentary Labor uh, Party. It was draped with the starry plow, the Kerry team jersey, the colors of his club, Karen's O'Rahi, and the insignia of the ITGWU. Pipers from St. John's Pipe Band led the funeral procession into Roth Cemetery, where Mr. Spring was laid to rest in his native county, Kerry. Dan Spring is survived by his wife Anne, daughters Noel, Maeve, and Kay, and his sons Donald, Arthur, and Dick, the current Labor Party leader. That's the news for tonight. I'm Mike Shefflin. Good evening. This is Eamon Kelly once again with a review of Irish Sports. It's brought to you by the Craig and Sever Federal and Savings. The Super Bowl of Gaelic football, the All-Ireland Championship Final, was played for the 99th time at Dublin's Croke Park yesterday. Similar to last year, Cork and Mead battled it out for the 1988 title. And what a battle it was, which neither team won in the end. For the first time since 1972, the All-Ireland Final ended in a tie with the final score, Cork one goal and nine points, Mead 12 points. While both teams have won the title four times, Cork were playing in their 17th final while Meade reached the final for the 11th occasion. This year's game certainly produced one of, the, one of higher standards than that reached between these two teams in last year's final. With the exception of about a 10 minute period late in the first half when play became very sloppy with petty fouling, it was a great contest between two evenly matched teams. The second half in particular pr produced an extremely high standard of football. The high feeling, precision passing and accurate shooting contributed to a memorable game. The opening moments of the game seemed to be somewhat slow paced, perhaps it was in contrast to the fantastic pace in which the hurling final was played in two weeks ago. However, the pace picked up shortly after Cork opened the scoring with an opportunist goal after two and a half minutes of play. The first half could be best described as intense, hard hitting, which neither side wanting to give or take an inch. Both defensive units seemed to have the jitters in the opening five minutes, but they settled down to play superb defensive football. Now let's go to the cameras of RTE for the opening goal of the game as described by Jerry Canning. Shea Fahey tussling there but it breaks down into the arms of Liam Hornan. Anxious to do well this afternoon. Liam Hayes through the middle towards Brian Stafford. Hot not deceiving Coleman Corrigan. Well judged. Little chip forward towards Paul McGrath. Martin O'Connell's his marker. Here's Dennis Allen. The 36 year old his first All-Ireland final, nice ball inside, McCarthy's moved inside, Teddy McCarthy shot, it's a goal! It was not until the 19th minute that Meade took the lead for the first time in the game with this point by Colm O'Rourke. Liam Harnan is dominating, we haven't seen much time so far. McCabe. by Tony Nation and Mead have taken the lead for the first time in the match with Colin O'Rourke's second point in this game and Colin O'Rourke has now scored six points in this year's championship Shortly after Larry Tompkins tied the game the Cork forwards started to apply pressure on the Mead goal and almost recorded a major score again described by Jerry Canning Sides level once before in this first half. 
and for the second time the sides are level on level terms Cork 1-2 Meath 5 points Larry Tompkins first score has taken 31 minutes to come very quickly taken to Conor Cunahan breaks down to McCarthy and so nearly a second Cork goal stopped on the line by Martin O'Connell and away from danger having some nervous moments of defence and just before half time Brian Stafford put Mead in front by a point from a free to leave the half time score Mead 6 points Cork 1 goal and 2 points with one point separating the teams in the first half at the halfway stage it illustrated in no uncertain terms how evenly matched these two teams were and the stage seemed set for a great second half one of the highlights of the first half was Mead's success in containing the great Larry Tompkins who was playing at centre half forward for Cork. The second half was a different story. Tompkins now playing at centre field was in complete control and tied the game with this well taken point within the opening minute of the second period. So second half's underway. McEntee touches it forward but only to the waiting Conor Cunahan. Dave Barry, by the way, has switched, I notice, positions with uh, Paul McGrath. Here's Paul McGrath. Up towards Michael McCarthy. He's got a very good point in the first half for Cork. Back to Shea Fahey as they look for the equaliser early in the half. Larry Tompkins drilling it in towards that canal end goal and the sides on level terms. It's the third time of the match that's been the case. And that equalising point comes after 28 seconds of the second half. It was a tremendous struggle for the next 20 minutes as one point lead was swapped several times. Between the fourth and fifth minute, Cork almost broke the game open with this attack on the Mead goal, which resulted in a great, in, should we say, a great save by the Mead goalkeeper, Mike McQuinlan. However, Dave Barry gained possession to pass to Larry Tompkins, who scored this great point. Fahey deep. Touchdown to Dave Barry. Oh, great save and point back raised by Ricky McQuinlan. That spectacular reaction. The referee saw him being held, and it's a free out to me. But he may have made an error against Mayo in the semi final. But he more than made amends when it really counted from Dave Barry's crashing shot, which was spectacularly saved by McQuillan. O'Connell's pass is slapped straight to Tony Nation. To Dave Barry. Back to Tompkins, looking for point number three, and it sails over the bar. A man who was born in Dublin, brought up for a time in Wicklow, played so much of his football in Kildare, and now he's in the red of Cork. Now rather than focus on the scores for the remainder of the game, let us concentrate on these final dramatic moments as captured by RTE. It's going to be Tompkins who will take it. Well, since he came into the Cork Colours last season, I think I've used the phrase that this is the most vital kick he's ever taken. He's just blessed himself. Will the gods smile favourably upon his pleas? The Cork fans are behind the canal goal, waiting for this kick. Will it be a winner? seconds to go. What a gripping final it's been. Well, what a kick. He may have missed some, but they'll forgive him all of those. O'Connell now in a desperate hurry. Cork, whose last win was in 1973, when Billy Morgan captained. This is O'Connell. Can they get on level terms? Cork must not foul. Meade must get a point. It's a free in. Shirts. The Mead fans smile down upon this up on Hill 16. I think this is headed for a replay. Stafford will kick. I've said it before, but
but you'd nearly put the life savings on the man to kick it over from here. But this is immense pressure. Stafford experienced it before. Tompkins experienced it a few minutes ago for Cork. One nine for Cork. 11 points for Meath. 45 seconds into injury time. And the sides are level. Stafford has kicked eight points. Tompkins kicked eight points. The battle of the big two. And I think we're going to have our first replay since 1972 when Offaly were here against Kerry. And one of the Meath players, Liam Hayes, might well have to miss that because, of course, he's due to go out to Seoul tomorrow morning to cover the Olympic Games. I'm headed there as well, but now I wonder. It's there. The referee leaves the game with the Cork players protesting about that last decision. It ends in a draw first time since 1972 that the match ended level. Well, as you saw, this great game ended in a welter of excitement. That last second free awarded to Meade, which resulted in the point that the tie the game will be talked about for a long time to come. Many feel that no foul occurred in that final Meade attack which deprived Cork of victory. Having watched the replay of that particular play several times, I could not concur with the referee's decision. But then again, the referee was only a few feet from the play and may have seen an infraction not captured by the TV cameras. The replay will be eagerly awaited by all Gaelic football fans and it should be another great contest. As of late Sunday evening, the replay date had not been announced. It is my guess that the game will be played two weeks from today at Croke Park. Incidentally, the minor football final was won by Kerry by the score of two goals and five points to Dublin's five points. I'm sure by this time next week we will have more information as to the replay of this All-Ireland football final and also if it's going to be telecast directly into the Irish Heritage Centre on the north side and Gaelic Park on the south side. So until next Monday at the same time, this is Eamon Kelly bidding you a very good evening. Thanks as always to Eamon Kelly for the sports report and remember the Gaelic season may be over but the Olympics have just started so stay tuned to Irish television for all the updates on the Irish partakers in the Olympic events. But now here's the bards for a tune. Here's a song ladies and gentlemen that was uh, very much associated with uh, the late Luke Kelly, the late great Luke Kelly of the Dubliners. And uh, every time we sing it, we, we think of a really one of the great, great ballad singers. So we'll sing it together here in Chicago and uh, right. we'll remember Luke on this one. For the Dublin contingent. I met my love by the gasworks wall. Do you know what? Dreamed a dream by the old canal. Kiss my girl by the factory wall. Dirty old town, dirty old town. I heard a siren from the dark. Train set the night on fire. Smell the spring in the smoky wind. Dirty old town, dirty old town. Dirty old town, 
the old town. Many thanks to the Bards for that nice number. Now we're traveling from Wexford, where the Bards come from, to the north of Ireland, specifically to the Armagh Cathedral. And we had a visit there with Father Murray, the pastor of Armagh Cathedral. And here's the interview we did with Father Murray. The forbidding Ulster landscape envelops this tall, steadfast landmark. This is Armagh Cathedral, the seat of the Primate of all Ireland, the ecclesiastical capital of the country. The cathedral is not only a splendid example of religious architecture, it is also an historic lodestone for the Catholic heritage of Ireland. The most famous clear man of them all, Brian Boru, High King of Ireland, is buried here. St. Patrick himself is said to have set aside the land as a site for St. Thara's church. Today, this hauntingly beautiful cathedral stands high, silhouetted against the Armagh sky, a comforting symbol for parishioners who face a daily struggle to preserve their faith, their livelihood and their heritage. We spoke to Father Murray about the history of the building. Uh, in 1835, we had uh, the Bishop of Darren Connor, William Crawley, was appointed Archbishop of Armagh. Now, uh, he came to Armagh, and uh, an extraordinary thing was he was the first Catholic Archbishop to live here in Armagh for 300 years. Now that's extraordinary because uh, Armagh is the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland and um, the reason for that was the penal laws against Catholicism here in Ireland uh, where the Archbishop wasn't allowed to reside in, in, in the town. But uh, 1829 was a very significant date, you see. Most Catholic churches uh, were taken over at the time of the Protestant Reformation, and therefore we had got the mass rocks and the small little chapels tucked away in side streets. And but 
uh, after 1829, you had a tremendous resurgence of church building. If you look at most of our churches, Catholic churches in Ireland, you'll see that they date around the 1830s after Catholic Emancipation in 1829. And that is the reason why William Crawley came to Armagh in 1835. It was uh, emancipation. And uh, then he set about, as a sort of sign of that liberation and triumphalism of Catholicism, uh, in Ireland, uh, a similar sign of that was the building of Armagh Cathedral and the re and the residing of the Archbishop once more in Armagh. There isn't one graveyard in the north of Ireland that doesn't hold the victims of the terrible tragedy that is Northern Ireland. Mourning has become a way of life here. Yet in recent times, even these once sacred resting places have played host to horrific scenes of hate and anger. The conflict in the six counties is a source of great concern and sadness to Father Murray, not just as a patriot and a northerner, but as a man who works on a ground level every day in a parish torn and wounded by the fear, the violence and the injustice that is the reality of life in Northeast Ireland today. I suppose one could say that whenever a, whenever a country is divided, uh, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be internal trouble with that. And uh, we are uh, a small nation, but a very ancient nation. I mean, uh, what's lacking in our size is made up by, by our antiquity and by our riches of our traditions, the likes of which there's nothing in Western Europe. I mean, our language, the Gaelic language, is the oldest vernacular language in Western Europe and is of great interest to scholars. Uh, we had uh, our sagas and legends written down and very, very uh, beautiful lyric poetry going back to the 8th century when you think of Dante comes hundreds of years later in, in Italian, etc. So uh, we have a very rich heritage and a very rich tradition. The trouble is that um, in, in the world that we live in, small nations aren't always tolerated. I mean, the great nations are allowed to be uh, great, they are allowed to be nationalists, but uh, they're inclined to thump and thump over smaller nations. And of course that's because they have power and might, and the greater their power and might, the more uh, uh, the question of the immorality of their, of their use of that power, the more, uh, the more that it's ignored. I mean, you know yourself, uh, if a small nation in South America that has undergone a, a terrible uh, oppression uh, by, by uh, a dictatorship or, or whatever, or by landed rich classes, uh, if they lift a few rifles to try and and uh, and uh, assert their rights, well, everybody's down on them like a ton of bricks, especially the bigger nations, uh, which shows how hypocritical the, the larger powers are. They can use all the big bombs and have their Star Wars and, and their nuclear weapons, whatever they like, and then they tramp down on the smaller people. But we've had this trouble because uh, uh, the whole question of Ireland is a question of power, that, that Britain did not want another nation at its back uh, as a security risk, which was uh, a very immoral uh, uh, motive for coming here in the first place. Uh, and uh, taken over and, and, and attempting conquest and keeping the people oppressed and oppressing them in their religion, oppressing them in their language, oppressing them in their own traditions, which was a terrible persecution for hundreds and hundreds of years. So uh, it, uh, these self-righteous people who who, who uh, come down, as I say, like a ton of bricks when people try to assert their rights, uh, they have nothing. They have absolutely nothing to, uh, uh, no argument on their own side as, as, as any kind of, uh, uh, what would we call them, honest brokers in, in, in a tragic situation. We have inherited uh, colonialism, which is the worst sin of all, and this country was divided, which was another sin, and uh, then we inherited in order that this northern statelet of Northern Ireland should survive, they, as a matter of policy, uh, oppressed the nationalists uh, with their loyalists and their British link uh, in, in every way of discrimination, of housing, of promotion, of jobs, so that they forced our people to emigrate. 
and uh, made them second class citizens. But uh, when it came to the 60s, when people weren't quite as weak as they had been here in the north of Ireland for 50 years previously, and uh, demanded uh, their rights, the answer to that, as in every, situ every colonial situation, whether it's South America or Middle America, or whether it's South Africa or any, the answer to that is not an answer of charity and goodness and generosity. Uh, to, to reach out and give people what, uh, and have fair play and justice. The answer was, as happens in all these colonial situations, is to put in the boot and not listen to you. But however, the, that movement, the civil rights movement, uh, was hit very hard in the beginning. Then, foolishly, people uh, resorted to arms um, at the beginning as a defence against loyalist mobs and then went on the offensive and have left us with this uh, present war which has gone on for 20 years. But whatever has happened here, and uh, you have seen the graves of people who have been fallen victims of that, uh, I know, you know, from my experience as, as a prison chaplain and looking down on on poor little girls who one who, who a few years ago were sitting in their desks in school that why were they now in prison and doing 10, 15, 20 years life years? They would have never been in jail except for a situation that came to their own doors. And that's true and, and I remember when I came here to Armagh Force in 1967 there wasn't a single Catholic woman in jail in the whole of Ireland for stealing or for anything. And uh, a few years later, I, I had 130 of them. Many of them sentenced to long prison sentences. So uh, it goes to show that it was it, a political problem. And it has now taken on, of course, very sadly, uh, tones of, of civil war, etc. Uh, but uh, the ideal is there within Ireland always uh, that someday, sometime, this ideal of our own country, with rights for everybody, with the sharing of all people's traditions, and what we want is an independent, neutral country. My father Murray, I I know that you've been a chaplain to the prison the prisoners, as you said, for 20 years, and that you're the administrator of the cathedral here. And that we have been uh, we have been talking on a on a subject that I wanted to, I wanted to talk about, and I'm very grateful that you gave us of your time because I could I don't know of anybody closer to the problem than you that I could have spoken to. It's a short notice, and uh, for this uh, tape for the Irish in America, I on my own behalf on behalf of Tom Looney, I'd like to thank you right. very sincerely. Very well. And coming up at the Abbey, we'd like to remind you that there is a great group coming here, which is the Fury Brothers and Davy Arthur. They'll be playing here at the Abbey Pub on October the 19th. For reservations, you would call 478-4408 or 539-6002. And I'd like to tell you about something else we have on offer here at Abbey Productions. We can now convert your videos from European style, which is PAL, over to American style, or vice versa, from American back to European, so you can preserve your memories of weddings, births, christenings, whatever you want, just a holiday, and you can send it over there for people to see, or send it over here for people to see. You can do a whole cross-Atlantic memory preservation thing. Give us a call, and we'll talk to you then about the conversions. And it's uh, time to say well, goodbye. it's time to say goodbye and close out the show. So until next week on Channel 25 at 7 p.m., it's good night for Irish Television Chicago. Good night. It was on the dreary New Year's Eve as the shades of night came down. A lorry load of volunteers approached the border town. There were men from Dublin and from Cork, German and Tyrone. But the leader was a Limerick man, Sean Self from Gary Owen. And as they moved along the street up to the barracks door, they scorned.
the danger they would meet The fate that lay in store They were fighting for old Ireland's cause To claim their very own And the foremost of that gallant band Was south from Gary Horn. But the sergeant, he spied their daring plan He spied them through the door Then the Sten guns and the rifles A hail of death did pour And when that awful night was o'er Two men lay cold as stone There was one from near the border One from Gary o no more will he hear the seagulls cry Or the murmuring shannon tide For he died beneath our northern skies Oh, Hanlon by his side He is gone to join that gallant band Of Plunkett, Pierce and Tone Another martyr for old Ireland Shone south from Gary Owen. Another martyr for old Ireland Shone south from Gary Owen.